week. Investors were a little spooked by what they saw today. What's your response to their response? Well, I, I think investors looked at the cash number and they were, you know, certainly it was a bit out of pattern for our second quarter, and I acknowledge it, it is. And as I described this morning during the call, a lot of it was by our choice. One, you know, we had record customer growth and we had to fund that customer growth and that requires cash out the door. And that's not business I'm gonna walk away from. And, and frankly, uh, the numbers and the, the economy is a bit stronger right now than we had anticipated last year when we set the plan. And I'm, I think it's a good thing we've got the customers coming in the door, but it did have a, a negative impact on cash. Secondly, we're investing at record levels in the business and we front end loaded our capital plan this year, which from our perspective is probably a good thing. It allows us to sell into that inventory and, and drive more broadband subscribers. And we were able to get more 5G coverage out there to our customers on mid band spectrum than what we had planned. That also took cash. The one element that I think you're referring to is we did see customers take a little bit longer to pay their bills and that had a working capital impact, but we were pretty clear that we weren't saying customers weren't paying their bills and we weren't saying that activity was slowing down. We just said simply that we've got customers taking a little bit longer to pay their bills and there was a working capital impact. And uh, in a business our size, you know, when you end up seeing them take a day or two longer to pay, that's a significant uh, impact to the cash flow. Now, what's also recent, really interesting here is this is a fairly recent trend that you've been seeing just over the last several weeks. A day or two, maybe not a huge deal, but what are the chances these delays get longer? Or are you expecting some of these customers potentially to cancel? I think we don't expect these customers to cancel. We, we've had you know, a lot of experiences going through economic downturns, uh, probably depending on what point of view you hold of the economy in the future right now, looking at, looking at projections, uh, certainly people are talking either soft landing or avoiding a recession altogether. Um, so, you know, we've been through much more severe cycles. And what we know is that customers really want to keep their connectivity services. They, they stick through. And that's why I said we don't view this as a cataclysmic problem at all. We see customers choosing to take a couple more days to pay their bills, creating a working capital problem, not a bad debt issue. Uh, and, you know, whether or not it gets more severe, I, I mean, I'm not a fortune teller. I wouldn't anticipate that in the economy right now based on the numbers we're seeing. But we do expect a more tepid environment working looking forward and uh, that tepid environment you know could slow down economic economic activity a little bit it could extend things a little bit we've taken a conservative view on our forecast right now we feel pretty comfortable that we've got that under control for the balance of this year you've cut your free cash flow forecast but you've maintained your capital spending plans as you've been talking about you are investing in the business will you have to cut the dividend no we don't have to cut the dividend. We have plenty of coverage on the dividend. We, we adjusted the dividend coming out of the Warner Brothers Discovery transaction. Uh, we just paid down over $40 billion of debt on the balance sheet, saw a great improvement to our adjusted net debt to EBITDA. As a result of that, we've got a lot of free cash flow cushion. We are investing at a record pace, both in customer growth and in our networks, as we've explained to our investor base. That's not a forever uh, rate of investment right now. We're repositioning the business. We're penetrating with fiber. We're improving some of our internal processes to take costs out. Those will start to yield dividends back into our business in terms of better operating performance and better operating leverage as we've characterized for the balance of this year. We'll have plenty of room to cover the dividend and we have plenty of room to invest in this business at a robust clip moving forward. And we feel very comfortable about that. You had said you were considering raising prices again. Are you still considering raising prices? And if so, by how much and when? Emily, I think what I said is that any company that gets into an environment where there's extended high inflation rates has to be aware of running both sides of the equation, not only being vigilant about costs and, and trying to make sure that they're on a perpetual cycle to take costs out of the business, but also being aware that if you're in a long extended inflationary cycle, sometimes you have to work the revenue side of the equation too. And you know, we did one of our first actions uh, earlier this year. And we, I think frankly engineered that as a win-win for customers. We did have to take some prices up, but we were also able to give the customers some more value as we took prices up, some new features and plans and services that they could migrate into. 
Um, I don't know what the next 12 months has in store. If it uh, extends on, will we see 9% inflation? Will we have to consider possibly some other actions on pricing? Uh, I would say that's not off the table. Right now, we haven't made any decisions around that or we don't have any specific plans. I'm curious if you think this is an industry-wide issue. Would you be surprised if T-Mobile and Verizon don't see customers putting off their bills? Uh, I, I don't know what T-Mobile or Verizon is going to report. I know what I reported and I know what our data is. And uh, I can tell you that our customers, uh, you know, basically have extended their payment cycle by about two days. And as I said, I'm not concerned about that given past history. Uh, I'm also looking at it relative to pre-pandemic levels. And it's not grocery out, gro grossly out of line with pre-pandemic levels. Um, what I can tell you is AT&T is kind of a mini microcosm of society and our customer base. Uh, I would think what we're seeing is, is kind of representative of the broader economy, but I don't know that for a fact. I just know the data I've got on my customers. All right. You've got a 23-state footprint in fiber, and I know one of your big ambitions is to make AT&T the best broadband provider in the United States. The competitive landscape is changing here and fast. Are you looking to buy or build beyond what you've done so far? You know, it's, it's a really good question, Emily. I think they'll put this in perspective from January of this year to this uh, today as we reported we've grown over 2 million connected locations on our fiber network, and we're now at 18 million connected locations. We are the scaled fiber provider in the United States, and we are building at a rate faster than anybody else that's deploying fiber. Our organic growth is what's powering this business right now. Our ability to muscle a supply chain, the resources, and the capabilities to go out and build more infrastructure and that is really the foundation of what we need to do moving forward. There are other people that deploy fiber in the United States. Frankly, most of them are subscale compared to us. And when we're having the success we're having, doing the things that we do well, engineering great fiber networks, learning how to penetrate them quickly, working through this on an organic basis, frankly, is, is probably the right play for us right now. Now, AT&T got out of the media business with the big sale of Time Warner, and since then we've seen streaming giants, media companies really struggle. What did you and AT&T see that, for example, Netflix didn't? Oh, I first of all, I think Netflix is, you know, to be praised and admired for what they've managed to create as a business. I mean, they've been a very successful company, and they have built a new model that will be the the dominant model of distributing entertainment content and and uh, all con consumption of video content for a decade to come. And uh, what I would tell you that I think we viewed as possibly being a little bit different and a little more quickly is many times I said I felt it was really important that these streaming platforms have a two-sided model, both subscription and advertising. And um, you know clearly. Uh, reports are, and the company itself has said Netflix is going to actually start to introduce advertising in their platform. I frankly think that'll be good for them over the long haul. It allows them to start thinking about other types of content like sports content that really does need to be alongside advertising in order for it to be a viable and economic approach. But um, you know, they had a great valuation and it's been tempered a bit. Um, my point of view on streaming is is not that it's a bad thing. I think what uh, I would like to see if I were in David Zaslav's shoes is that uh, he moves a little bit closer to their valuation and maybe they kind of came down to a more realistic valuation. And all things considered, I think it's going to be a strong and viable business moving forward as, as ultimately the early innings of this shake out and we get into a steady state. And I think uh, David and Warner Brothers Discovery is well positioned for that. And do you think the, the shutting down of CNN Plus was, was the right move based on what you knew? I don't know. I wasn't in the room at the time. You know, mm -hmm. David has, after the transaction closed, a lot of different, you know, considerations, his own strategies as to where he wants to take the business, his own decisions on how he wants to allocate capital. I'm not party to those conversations. I don't know what they were. And I'm sure within that context, he made a decision that he felt was best for the business. So one last question, John, to wrap this up. You know, we also saw your business segment a little weak, and I'm wondering what other companies should be looking at for signals here in your report. 
Are businesses pulling back more broadly on spending? And should that be a warning sign about the economy? You know, I don't think so, Emily. I, I think in our circumstance, you know, we have a very unique position in the business market. We are the largest provider of services to large complex organizations. And that's an envied position to have, but they're also the businesses that are going through the fastest rate of technology evolution. And they are orienting themselves away from traditional networks that used to be operated and managed exclusively by companies like us to software defined networking, which ultimately shifts some of the capabilities either to the company itself or into a hyperscaler environment. And that changes our role in those particular companies. And, and that's why as a business, we're pivoting away from our strong position on the enterprise side. We'll continue to service those customers and meet their needs in the way we can match them. But we, we really want to strengthen our position in the mid-market and our bit brand is very well positioned to do that. They're the types of customers who still need our expertise and our owned and operated infrastructure to run their companies. And we're underpenetrated there and we have an opportunity for a great amount of growth as a result of that. So I don't think it's a weakness in business. In fact, I think networking is getting more and more important, both mobile and fixed for all business customers. It's more of a pivot on technology and how we're positioning our company to line up against that.